Gladstone, Gladstone's eye. And uh, those who've never seen Gladstone's eye can't understand his place in history. It depended entirely upon a terrifying glance that he used to give people. And you wanted to sink through the earth. I had it in the most terrifying form, far worse than Arthur Balfour can ever have had it. Because uh, Arthur, Mr. Gladstone came to stay with my people. And uh, I was the only male. And uh, after dinner, when the ladies retired, I was left tete a tete with Mr. Gladstone. I was only 17 and very, very shy. And it was far the worst experience of my life. Nothing since has terrified me. I was seared to terror forever. He said only one thing. He said, This is very good port they've given me, but why have they given it me in a claret glass? And I didn't know the answer. He was frightening beyond all belief. Now, I had a grandmother who was terrifying in the sort of way that great ladies wear in those days. Uh, absolutely terrifying. And uh, I'd seen her make footmen weep. And uh, altogether she was quite frightful. And one day Mr. Gadsden was coming to tea, and she told us beforehand all she was going to say to Mr. Gadsden, telling him off about his Irish policy, which he didn't approve of. And I was there throughout the whole of his visit, and she was as mild and gentle as you could possibly be. And not one word did she say of what she told us she was going to say. It's one of the things about him. The people who knew him called him Mr. Gladstone, and the people who didn't know him called him Gladstone. But all of us who knew him always called him Mr. Gladstone. <laughs> I remember that he first went into Parliament to uphold slavery. In 1832, when it was a question of slavery in Jamaica, his father owned a lot of slaves in Jamaica, and one of his purposes in going into Parliament was uh, to preserve slavery in Jamaica. Uh, he enumerates all his purposes, and at the same time he can't quite persuade himself that he was justified in Sunday travelling in order to get into Parliament. There's a story of Parnell, one of his followers came up to him and wanted to make some move in the house and uh, Parnell turned to another man and said, you know, he's not afraid of Gadsden. He thinks he can get the better of him. I don't think that. I can't get the better of him. And that was Parnell. Gadsden is a public speaker. Had the most amazing, complicated secret. No man living now could keep in his head extempore as Mr. Gladstone did. That's the story of the drunken man. The uh, Tories at a great meeting that he was going to address had uh, managed to smuggle the drunken man into the front row to interrupt the meeting. And the drunken man did his very utmost to uh, spoil Mr. Gladstone's oration. And at last Mr. Gladstone turned upon him and said, May I request that gentleman who has not once but repeatedly interrupted the flow of my observations to extend to me that large measure of courtesy which, were I in his place and he in mine, I should undoubtedly extend to him. And the drunken man didn't utter another word. The handling of words that existed and is now lost was due to being brought up on Cicero. They all got the Ciceronian syntax in their heads and it was so much in their heads that they could bring it out extempore in the way that uh, we can't now. Yeah. But uh, whether it was worthwhile to have Ciceronian syntax and not understand the modern world is another question. <laughs>